Welcome all to the Cosmos Briefing. My name is Professor Alan Duffy, Lead Scientist of the Royal Institution of Australia, an organization established to raise awareness of the value and relevance of science and scientific methods in everyday life, showing through conversations like this and engaging content on social and digital media with Cosmos, how fundamental science is to our lives. It has been two years since the official launch of the Australian Space Agency. While the agency is still young, it has already opened exciting doors for the nation from fast growing startups to multinational collaborations. But how can we support Australia's space industry in its expansion? What can we do to stay competitive in this global endeavor? And how do we maximize the benefits of these efforts at the final frontier for Aussies down here? Joining us today to discuss this fascinating topic is Aud Vignella, the Chief Technology Officer at the Australian Space Agency. Aud is a space and aeronautics engineer who began her career at the European Space Agency in the Netherlands and has 30 years experience delivering large and complex programs, introducing new technology in the telecommunication space and media industries. With uh, joining her is Adam Gilmore, CEO and co-founder of Gilmore Space Technologies, a venture funded space technology and rocket company in Queensland intending to launch small satellites to orbit from 2022. This is all part of a development of small low cost rockets purpose built for today's era of small satellites. And uh, finally, we have Dr. Cassandra Steer. Uh, she is a mission specialist with the Australian National University's Institute of Space, also known as InSpace and a senior lecturer at the Australian National University's College of Law, specializing in space law, space security, and international law. Now, before we begin with our discussion, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land from which I'm joining you today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I wanna pay my respects to the elders past, present, and emerging, and extend those respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples joining us today, and from the lands from which you are viewing this. Ord, I'll get you to uh, kick us off. What does the Australian space sector currently look like? Thank you, uh, Alan. It's a very good question. Um, and it, there is no simple answer. As, as you know, space embraces so many disciplines. I, I don't think of one um, work profession you have that doesn't have an application in space. In Australia, we've been working in space for a long time. It's not because the agency is only two years old that uh, we haven't been active in space. Mm -hmm. You remember the, the role we had uh, during the landing on the moon. Uh, our communication capability have been top notch for quite a long time. So there are areas where we are very mature and very experts. There are areas, other areas where we are developing this maturity. So the industry space sector in Australia is vital Brand. I think that's the best adjective we can we can choose. Uh, we are already making our mark in uh, in several disciplines and developing others. Um, I do have to mention, for example, uh, with the landing of Perseverance on Mars this weekend, uh, you will know that one of the instrument Pixel was led by a PI instrument, um, a, a PI uh, person that is Dr. Abigail Alwood uh, and Dr. David Flannery. So. Um, very proud uh, to have Australian on, uh, on that mission. Uh, so we are very active and very expert in several domains. And uh, the strategy that we have published two years ago now is, a highlight is highlighting seven areas where we believe we have a competitive advantage or an opportunity to grow. So a bit of a long answer, um, but it's a very, very complex um, uh, picture that, that I've described, but the sector is vibrant um, and, and lots, just the beginning of a, of a big growth that we're working on developing. What would be the, the rough split between say domestic uh, uh, industry and those, those larger primes, those international uh, uh, companies or indeed even organizations? Is it, is it, would you say that Australia has that growing national capability, um, but that it's still relatively heavily weighted to these internationals? To answer this question depends what we're talking about. What's the service you want to uh, you want to deliver and you want to uh, to acquire? Sometimes the answer is we want a national capability because we're the best. 
Sometimes we want a national capability because we want a sovereignty. So you really know, need to understand the, the question and the, um, and, and the best solution to your, to your problem. Is it fair to say it's 50-50? No, I don't think it's as simple as that. Uh, every every sector and every area of our priorities would have a different, uh, different answer. Um, to, to give you an example, when you look at Earth's observation, for example, we do not have our own asset in space for Earth's observation yet. I hope we will have one uh, eventually. But we have developed an expertise in gathering the data of the Earth's observation satellites and doing something with it. And we've developed product with it. Geoscience Australia is developing this uh, digital Earth Australia. So we have developed an expertise because we didn't have an asset in space. And, and you could say this is a national, um, a national expertise. Um, so every area would, would have a different answer, but we could maybe say it's 50-50, um, agreeing on, on what we define as a space capability and, and, and what is not. So again, not a simple answer. Okay, so Adam, uh, what, what skills and training is needed to get into the space sector? You are a, a notably uh, a harder edged kind of, of, of uh, um, expertise, uh, quite literally building rockets. Uh, what are those kinds of skills and trainings required? Uh, we've got a wide variety. Um, I think if I had to pick one side of engineering that we have the most of, it's mechanical engineers. Um, they seem to fit well into the propulsion teams and into the obviously the mechanical teams, the structures teams. Uh, but we need all kinds of engineers, electrical engineers, chemical engineers, um, civil engineers for launch sites. Um, you know, that's kind of on the engineering side. We obviously have a decent sized documentation team, which has legal expertise. We have a marketing team. Um, on the actual manufacturing side, we need a lot of people that have welding skills, machining skills. Uh, so, you know, there's a wide gamut of skills in, in, in our rocket company, um, but the bulk of them are engineers. Is there a gap between what we need and what we provide as, as educators, you know, particularly to operate at that internationally relevant level? I think, I mean, there's definitely a gap. It's manageable now, but what I'd love to see is a greater engagement between companies like ours and universities where we work on curriculum and really hands-on stuff. And we've, we've been thinking about it. There's quite a lot of smaller projects that we can do with university students in their final year that is very space-related. It could be a component that we have. It could be the redesign of a component or making it better. You know, it could be some avionics system that we want to get built or designed. And I think that's probably the next level is to get, you know, students in universities to have hands-on experience with building, testing, failing. And that's really valuable experience for companies like ours, because otherwise we've got to teach them as soon as they come and it takes six to 12 months. Um, and, you know, if they're failing, they're failing on our dollar and, and, and it's more expensive. Yeah, that, that, that's fair enough. And to be, you know, I'll, I'll put my hand up as an educator. We, we want to teach our students, as you say, it's, it's not necessarily how to fail, but how to deal with failure, right? We, because that's a reality of life. And in particular, in the space sector, you really are pushing boundaries. Yeah, I agree. I think, you know, if there's a, if there's a skill set that our engineers are good at, it is how to adapt from failure, how to adapt from something not working. And I think if I'm proud of the most, the most proud of anything we do here is that we continually overcome challenges. And, you know, every day we come up with a roadblock and our engineers figure out a way to get around the roadblock. And it's, I can give you some incredible stories. I mean, I've told people that, you know, the propulsion tank on the third stage is, is too tall and it's coming up into the payload bay. And I want an answer to that. And in the afternoon, the, the mechanical team comes down and says, all right, we can fatten the propulsion tank and get another 30 centimeters of payload bay. And I was like, wow, you guys did that in an afternoon. That's pretty good. I love it. That, that is problem solving at its finest. Um, now, Cassandra, it's not just uh, engineering and indeed Adam alluded to, to other uh, uh, sectors um, beyond the quite literal rocket engineering that I think a lot of us might imagine when we think of space. Where, where else uh, is, is there core capability in Australia and a need for training uh, beyond those, those harder edge engineering aspects? 
So I would say right now, I mean, I'm a space lawyer. So obviously I look at, at law and policy and, and strategy as well if I'm thinking about space security in a defense perspective. Um, and I was never very good at science in, or maths in school. I'm, I'm not naturally a STEM person. Um, and so I very much steered away from any careers or ideas about my future that had anything to do with technology. But if someone had said to me when I was in high school or even starting out my law degree, you could be a space lawyer, you could be involved in this amazing sector and in human exploration and in all of the, the security and international political ramifications of our activities in space, I would have been really excited. Um, so I think there's kind of, there's two messages. One is we need to have more people looking at STEM careers, more girls going into STEM, more indigenous kids going into STEM, a diversity of people realizing that they have a, there's a wide set of skills. Like Adam said, there's a, a wide range in STEM. There's a whole diverse set of skill sets um, there. But then if, if, you know, if you're like me, not actually a very mathematically oriented person and you're much more into the humanities, um, there are whole career trajectories there. And right now, I think it's something that Australian government and decision makers and policy makers need is, is a better understanding of space. So we actually need greater space literacy across the board. Uh, speaking of which, on the, in the international sphere, what, what actually is the current status of the international space rules or law uh, that our companies are actually operating under? So there's, there's two layers. We have international space law and then we have domestic or national space law. And international space law comes essentially from the five core space treaties that were all written in the 1960s at the beginning of our first space age um, and also at the height of the Cold War. So those treaties are still really important. You often hear people questioning how relevant they are and if they need to be updated or rewritten. Uh, and my answer is always, no, you don't need to update them. You have to think of those like a constitution. They, they're written the way constitutions are, which is here's a, a document which sets down general principles and our value sets and how we want to organize ourselves. And then like our Australian constitution doesn't organize how companies operate or how we sign contracts or how you go about your daily life. It sets about our political organization and we don't want that constitution to change. That is our stability um, as a society. The same goes for these treaties. They set out the core principles which were, which were established during a politically tense time in history, the competition between the US and the Soviets, you know, their, their technological and political competition was extending into space um, to see who was going to win that race was really going to be a, a marker of who was, who was winning the entire political race. Um, and yet these competing powers managed to sit down very quickly, they realized they needed to ensure continued access to space. They needed to keep space stable and accessible for all. And so they agreed to rules that would restrain each other as competitors as much as themselves. And those rules are still really important. So things like no one can claim sovereignty in space, ownership of space. Space has to be accessible to all, regardless of economic development or without any discrimination. Um, and our activities in space should benefit all. Um, and then there are some, some um, very important articles that say that the states themselves, the countries, remain responsible for all activities in space, whether they are governmental or non-governmental. So that includes commercial companies. And out of that particular provision of the Outer Space Treaty, which also says that the countries have to authorise and continually supervise all activities that take place. So out of that, that provision, we have domestic or national space laws that are put in place. So that's why it's so important that we now have our own space agency since 2018 that is responsible for putting those rules in place because Australia is responsible under international law for everything that an Australian company does. The Australian government needs to make sure that it has oversight, that it knows who's doing what, and that it's able to regulate that a little bit in terms of um, things like, for instance, sustainability of space, are companies like Gilmore designing their rockets in such a way that their environmental impact can be reduced? Are companies that are building satellites thinking about what happens at the end of that satellite's life? What are they going to do? Are they going to save a bit of fuel and try and deorbit it so that it burns up on re-entry? Or what are they going to do to extend its life so that we can reduce space debris? 
So we have international law regulating states, but out of that, we have the states, the countries regulating um, individual companies, as well as its own government activities. Well, I might then just, just throw to, to Aud for thoughts on the role of the agency in this regard. And in particular, uh, we see this, this move to utilize the moon. Uh, you know, I, I, I co-supervise a number of students who are actually trying to figure out new ways to mine the moon. So this is an area of a very much hot topic uh, we are a signatory to the Moon Treaty, but we also have signed the Artemis Accords supporting NASA's return to the Moon and indeed beyond. Uh, and key to that will be exploration and, and extraction, perhaps, of some of those resources from the Moon to support. So, uh, or you know, is is there a um, is there a conflict between those ideals? Do we do we um, struggle as a nation in uh, exploring and expanding through through space, using it while adhering to all of the, the various rules that we have signed up to? I, I don't think it's a challenge. I, I think it's the opportunity. And I think we are one of the only country having signed both. Correct me if I'm a wrong, Cassandra. Um, and, and I think the only country. And I love that. I love being able to say, Australia, we are the first in doing this because that means we are onto something. And that means we have an opportunity to be the, the best at that. And there is a lot of example where we can already say we are the only one. So I, I, I see this as a big opportunity uh, to be able to uh, explore the moon and, and support NASA in going forward to the moon with the Artemis project. And we have a big program going on with them uh, as we speak, um, is uh, the Moon to Mars program. Uh, I think it's a fantastic opportunity to, uh, to do things uh, right. and and leveraging on our capability that we have in, in supporting this mission. Um, talking about competitiveness at, at the beginning, remote operation and robotics is an area of priority for us. And when you look at all the work that we are doing remotely in, uh, uh, from the mining industry, um, when everything is, is operated from Perth uh, in the Pilbara region that is 2,000 kilometers away, we have an expertise there, an operational industrial expertise, so a, a very strong track record there. It's on the ground, but let's see what we can export um, in, in space. And this is definitely an area where we have a, a role to play, and NASA is very, very interested in, uh, in continu continuing collaboration there because they have already uh, some project uh, happening with uh, with some company in, uh, in Perth, like uh, like Woodside and, and the like. Um, so an opportunity to, to explore this and, and be on the on the forefront and, and we are doing well so far. Um, another point on international um, space is international. And, and I think that's one of the attraction of space is you can do things alone, but it's you, you do better things and bigger things when we're all working together. The International Space Station is a, is a great example. Uh, having three nations, uh, astronauts representing three nations uh, up there when, when politically on the ground, these nations had some issue, but in space, you have to continue to collaborate. So the, the, the international role, is, I think, is one of the role the agency is, uh, is key, opening the doors, uh, signing all, all the this MOU that we've done. Uh, we are identifying projects we can do with our international counterpart. Um, and for the international counterpart, having one door to knock on now that we exist is, is making the conversation and the exchange uh, easier. So that's opening the door internationally. Um, nationally, the role of the agency is now that we've done these seven areas of priority that we came up with that not because you know it looks it looked interesting. We spend a lot of time deciding where we wanted to focus. Um, as I said, space is very vast in terms of disciplines. Do we want to do everything? No, we need to pick up the areas where either we have, a, as I said, a competitive advantage. And that competitive advantage could be as simple as the location where we are. We're looking at the southern hemisphere. Um, so a lot of people have an interest to put antennas here for communication, but also for space situational awareness. And uh, Cassandra and I are, are passionate about that subject. So if you press that button, I hope you have a lot of time because <laughs> it's something we are working uh, very strongly together. Um, so we are hosting a lot of antennas um, and we have a, a strong role to play there. So just the location and then the vastness of our country uh, because it's so big, Earth observation from space makes sense. Communication from space makes sense. Uh, position, navigation, and timing. So this is where 
uh, all these areas of priority comes from. Um, and you may have um, seen just before Christmas, the agency has released the first technology roadmap. Uh, so it's going one level down into the details of what we want to do for each of these priority areas. So advanced communication was the first um, roadmap we've issued and we're gonna issue the rest this year. And this technology roadmap shows the vision. Where do we want to be in 10 years time? Uh, what are the focus segments we want to concentrate on? And what's the pathway to go from where we are today to where we want to be in 10 years time? And, and you'll see in the, in the roadmap, there is a poster you can, uh, you can open and put on your wall. And, and it really shows the pathway uh, step by step because we believe you know, when you want to do a big thing in, step, in space, you go step by step, make sure you're stable, you go to the, to the next step. Um, and I hope this is giving really a, a guide for any, any initiative in Australia being academic, being industry, startup, government, this is what we believe the pathway should be. Um, and you can see this month, there is so many different initiatives that are leading the same um, towards the same direction the manufacturing roadmap and the grants um, the bushfire how can we help with space there is so many directions and um, that that is leading the way i think it's uh, this year is going to be a, a very interesting year and and we're going to start seeing some some really good space mission for australia Alan, could I circle back to, to the start of that question regarding the Artemis Accords and, and the Moon Agreement? Because I absolutely agree with Ord. Australia is in this really exciting position that we have so many opportunities in different areas to contribute to what's going on in space and, you know, robotics and mining. It's really the future of, of a lot of technologies where we can have a leading edge. Um, but from a legal and policy perspective, we're in a very interesting position. So we are the only country in the world that is both a signatory of the Artemis Accords and a, a signatory to the Moon Agreement. Both of those clubs are pretty small and to themselves. There's only nine countries with the invitation for a couple more to join the Artemis Accords. But that's based on an invitation from the US to say, who do, we, who do they want to partner with on, on the Artemis program to, to return to the Moon? So it's a, it's a self-selecting club. They, there are certain countries they will not be inviting. Um, obviously, Australia was excited to be invited um, and it's a great opportunity, but we're also part of this other very small club, which is there are only 18 countries that have signed the Moon Agreement, the fifth of the five core space treaties. It was the last one that was written in 1979, mostly non-aligned countries, um, who felt that they could, they could already see that there were going to be competitions around future technological capabilities. If we're able to mine the moon or asteroids, that's going to turn into a point of competition. Historically, we've always fought over resources. That's where global politics have their tension points. And so the moon agreement says, anyone who signs this treaty agrees that as soon as the technology seems feasible, we're going to set up an international regime to govern those activities, some kind of new body, some kind of new set of rules to make sure everyone has access to what's being mined, everyone can benefit from it. And it doesn't just become a competition of, of a small club of elite powers. And here we are today where the competition for mining the moon in particular is starting to gear up. And it is a bit of an international competition. China's making moves, you know, Russia's interested. Um, the, the club that it, the US decides to work with has political ramifications. Um, and those Artemis Accords state in, in very clear terms that mining of extraction of natural resources can and shall take place and is in accordance with the Outer Space Treaty, despite the fact that I just said the Outer Space Treaty says you can't own anything in space. And so there's tensions around that interpretation. Australia has now said we agree with the US's interpretation that that can happen. There are some international space lawyers who say, we're not so sure that can happen. And then there are some who say, well, maybe we should have an international regime. The US doesn't want a part in any such international regime. And yet Australia is obliged to establish an international regime because of our signing up to the moon agreement. So it puts us in a difficult position, but it also puts us in a really amazing position in terms of Who's Australia going to be as a middle power in the 21st century? So global relations are shifting, particularly since the last five years. We're now almost a quarter of the way through the century. 
we're into a multipolar reality. Again, we don't have a single superpower. Global relations are shifting. Middle powers like Australia have once again, like they did decades ago, a really important role to play in terms of diplomacy, in terms of determining um, the rules-based order that's going to apply on Earth and in space. So Australia actually has a really great opportunity to step up and try and influence the US and say, space is a global commons. It's great. We want part of this, this competitive environment. We want to be part of the Artemis program, but we want to make sure that it adheres to the principles of our constitution for space, which is that it should be accessible for all. It should be regulated internationally. Wonderful. So innovation in technology, but then also innovation in uh, policy and regulation as well on that international scale. But so these, these are uh, issues for, um, uh, well, for the future, but actually very much uh, uh, coming quickly. Today, we are seeing, Adam, a continued uh, growth in the domestic, uh, small and medium uh, enterprises, the SMEs, uh, across the sectors. And we've been speaking about some of those, robotics and uh, communications and, and earth observation and the like. But you know, how do we, as a nation, how do we support that? How do we drive that growth? How do we turbocharge that growth to take advantage of this exciting future, as we've just heard? Well, we, we discussed this on the Space Task Force uh, in, in great detail. And I think the common theme was that the government has a role to play in, in two, two key aspects. So I think the first aspect is there is a common understanding that taking technology from low technology readiness levels, like a TRL-4, up to 7, 8, and 9, which means you're ready to go to space or you've worked in space, costs a lot of money and is kind of like the belly of death for a lot of SMEs. And so there's a role for government to, to play in providing R&D funding to move through that valley of death of TRL, so to speak. And the second thing that was important is if we want to compete in global supply chains and, and with global customers, it's important for us to have the government as an early customer uh, you know, for an SME and so I think that's what I hope to see in the, in the, in the, in the short term is that we get the government, um, they're doing it through the MMI, that will be a fantastic um, enabler of developing technology. That's and the, the modern step, manufacturing. Yeah, modern manufacturing initiative. Uh, space is one of the six priorities. Um, it was the first that was announced um, for funding, which is fantastic. Um, very short window, by the way. So we've all got to scramble to get proposals in. <laughs> I'm writing seriously too. <laughs> exactly. But the second thing is important is the government's got to step up to the plate and be an early customer. Other countries do that very successfully. And I think that's the second part that will make, you know, the space industry really go fast as quickly as possible. And we, have, we, we haven't yet mentioned uh, defence. We've spoken about the as a geopolitical uh, um, uh, consideration one must have when you talk about about space, but you know, is defense as a a significant and indeed you know very positive supporter funder of the space research and development today? Is that uh, is that welcomed? Is it sustainable? The level is it is it even desirable in the longer term? Do we want to wean ourselves off defense contracts as a national sector, or will they always have a a key role to play? Uh, I think it's, I mean, space technology is definitely dual use. And I think the defence has a role to play. I think actually our defence has been pretty light in terms of the interaction and the funding that's gone into the Australian space industry, but they're starting to become aware. They're starting to formulate plans. And I think as we've seen on the civilian side, there'll be a lot more activity in the years ahead on the defence side. Uh, they definitely want access to space. They want sovereign capability. They want sovereign satellites. And so I think that in the years ahead, they're going to be much more involved in the commercial space industry because the commercial space industry will provide them the services they want for the defence needs. If I can add to this, um, when we write and develop our roadmap, uh, we have an expert group helping us doing this and defense is, is as a representative in each of this group. Uh, to me, when you do space, um, you talk to defense. 
we we want to develop the same capability we want to use the service for different purposes i think that's where the the difference is space situational awareness is a good example we want the data because we want to make sure we use space responsibly they want the data to uh, make sure their asset in space is safe and 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 for for military purposes but but the building of the capability and, and where we want to be good and, and develop our expertise is, is the same. And, and there was an announcement uh, last year uh, where Linda Reynolds has um, uh, shared $50 million of their funding to do project with the agency around communication. So um, there is a strong collaboration um, in building this capability. And, and, it's, and it's something that is, uh, that is very productive. Um, so. Uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm echoing everything you said, Adam. Now we've got uh, an incredible situation where our uh, startups, we have you know, Gilmore with us. There's of course also Miriota Fleet doing exceptional things with, with uh, relaying the information from remote sensors, connecting up essentially the vast continent of Australia uh, and the largest uh, operators of, of satellites are uh, companies that essentially didn't really I, I think it's fair to say it didn't even exist 10 years ago. So, you know, Cassandra, as startups rather than superpowers drive the utilization of space, how do we ensure that rules-based order uh, uh, survives and, and is adaptable to that new reality? It's a really great question. Um, and I think what we're seeing in Australia is a reflection of what's happening globally is that the commercial space sector is, is running the show, which is great in certain respects because Companies who have incredibly talented people like Adam has at Gilmar um, are able to push the boundaries a lot faster. They don't have to answer to public opinion the way that a, a civil space program has to. Um, uh, and they're not dependent on, on you know, meeting whatever is in those defence contracts or government to find roles. So it's really exciting in that sense. Um, but we're seeing pressure. And when, when we look at the biggest player in the US, so 50% of all of today's current operational satellites are commercially owned. Um, that's a different picture from a couple of decades ago. Um, there's about three and a half thousand operational satellites today. In the next 10 years, there's going to be 100,000. Um, and 50% of all the operational satellites today are owned by SpaceX, by one company. And they are the ones who are pushing into the tens of thousands rapidly. Um, and so in the US in particular, the space uh, sector, the commercial space sector, has been pushing the government to change its regulations, to deregulate a little bit, to allow them to be even more competitive and to be the, the most preeminent power in, in competitive power in space, um, which is pushing the government actually to interpret its international obligations in ways that some other countries disagree with. Um, so I, again, this is a really great moment for Australia. The commercial space sector globally has its eyes on Australia and it has done for the last couple of years because we have a space agency with a pretty amazing mandate, which is to support industry. It's not to set up a government owned civil space program. It's to pour government money into industry and have that be Australia's presence in space. That's really exciting. And com companies around the world are, are looking to Australia to see what's happening for that reason. But we have to be careful that the, the line continues to be softly trod between we want to be competitive, we want to um, enable companies, Australian companies, to do great things and give them all of the structures that will give them the freedom to do that. But we also want to be a responsible actor in space. Uh, and that requires thinking long-term, long-term sustainability. It also requires taking into account military tensions in space, the, the current huge military tensions that we're seeing in space. Um, and again, it goes to us being a middle power. It goes to the opportunity we have with having such a new space agency. Uh, and I think the space agency is doing a really great job of, of keeping that line clear. So the work that's being done, for instance, on the implementation of the UN's long-term sustainability guidelines, um, the agency is doing a great job of reaching out to industry and seeing what they're already doing uh, and then seeing what could be implemented, for instance, to incentivize more sustainable or responsible behavior, intergenerational responsibility and response. There is no profit margin in the next five years if we keep filling space with stuff the way we are. We have such a problem of space debris um, and space traffic management. 
that that companies can't survive in that environment unless we think long term. And so that is the government's responsibility. And I think the space agency so far, from what I see from the work I'm doing with Auden and others internally, is they're really doing their utmost to tread that line. Um, and we just have to keep keep focusing on that and how to strike that balance. And, and again, I think we can do a lot internationally in that respect. The UK is being an amazing global leader right now in terms of sustainable um, the implementation of those long-term sustainability guidelines into their national policies and laws, but also really encouraging other states, other countries to step up globally and trying to force, if we can force an international pressure that this stuff is really important and urgent, then that, then that will be implemented at a domestic level. And again, that's a great opportunity for Australia to stand up and have a voice internationally on that and to demonstrate that by implementing those kind of requirements into our domestic laws while also making sure that doesn't hinder hinder industry. Okay, look, I think that's, that is a balance that will have to be met in the coming years. And as you say, the, the challenge of space junk, the debris up there will only get worse unless we actively mitigate it. And that stuff when it's up there can last for years, if not centuries. So uh, hopefully we will, we will prevent the Kessler syndrome from occurring where we lose our access to space and all the advantages from everything in traffic management, agriculture or mining, marine fisheries uh, and more that we benefit every day from. Now, this is, as you've mentioned, uh, Cassandra, it's been two years, just over two years since the agency launched. The sector has changed remarkably. Now it's the bonus question uh, time for you three. I want you to, to gaze into the uh, glass ball and uh, I'll kick off with you, Ord. Where, what are you most excited by and looking forward to seeing in the Australian mm -hmm. space sector two years from now? Lots of things, because you never dream too big. Uh, I mean, I've, I've been in Australia for 20 years and wondering why we didn't have a space agency. So I dreamt of a space agency. We have one now. Um, oh, well, thank so you for I that. Keep... That was great that you that. <laughs> I, was, uh, I know you worked hard for it as well. We, we, we were a, a nice bunch and Adam as well. Um, so lots of dreams to come. I'm ticking them one, one by one. I think the next step for me is to is to have a set in space. Um, and that's, that's really where this roadmap are looking at when we look at the opportunity in 10 years time there, there is a, an enabler across all these seven areas is manufacturing satellites um, mm -hmm. and we're looking at the the sweet spot is probably you know 150 200 kilogram satellite um, and and answer all our needs and uh, we will create high skilled jobs by doing so um, and we will answer our our specific needs even bushfire you know when there was a disaster um, last year we had a lot of discussion with uh, other countries who are suffering from bushfires, uh, Canada, uh, USA, um, Portugal, Indonesia. I learned that every fire is different. And even if NASA and Canada have their own spacecraft to manage their fire, trying to prevent them, manage them better, recover better from them, the sensor they use is, is for their type of tree for the morning because that's where the fire is worse for us in the afternoon. I learned a lot of things. So it's important to be able to do the mission for your, your need. Um, so when I look in the roadmap, I'm, I really hope there is opportunities to do Earth observation, satellites, communications, um, weather as well. We, de we depend on, on uh, overseas f uh, services so much. So manufacturing satellite for me is a... It, it's something I'm, I'm really looking forward to. Um, and if you look even uh, even further down the line, you know, uh, it's nothing that stop, stop us to design, build and launch all made in Australia, uh, our satellites in the future. And so um, I, I keep dreaming and ticking off the dream as we go along. All right, uh, Cassandra, same question to you. Two years from now, what are you most excited by and looking forward to seeing in the Australian space sector? So the, the technology is in really great hands. So the, the two things I focus on as an educator and a space lawyer are exactly that. In the next two years, I'm really excited to see um, universities collaborating more because we have different kinds of expertise at different universities around Australia to come up with something that could look like a national space studies um, you know, Australian Space University, where students could do modular study and learn a, a bit from Swinburne, a bit from the ANU, a bit from Adelaide, a bit from, you know, the University of Western Australia, whatever universities with different capabilities and, and expertise. Um, and, and, and really kind of answering the excitement that there is for space in a, in a totally new way. We have to rethink how we're delivering education in a post-COVID world. And I think 
space studies is, is a great place for us to start doing things really differently. Um, so I look forward to that starting to take off in the next two years. And the other thing as a space lawyer that, that I'm really looking forward to and hopeful for is the thing I keep mentioning about Australia stepping up as a middle power. So Defence is currently writing its first space strategy and, and there's a lot for us to look for in terms of both defence and civil space. Who are we going to be in the Asia Pacific region? What kind of partnerships are we going to build? What kind of capacity building can we do with our smaller Pacific region partners? Um, what that's going to mean for allyship and those kind of things. You know, I would love to see Australia really step up as, as a responsible demonstrating responsible leadership and demonstrating long-term sustainability in our policy and our talk and then also walking the walk and being regional leaders. All right. Adam, what are you most excited by and looking forward to seeing in the Australian yeah, space sector? Easy in the one. Years? Australian satellite launched on an Australian launch vehicle from an Australian launch site and it's in the pipe. Our first vehicle launch has an Australian made satellite with an Australian made fire detection satellite on it. And we're locking down where we're going to launch from. It's somewhere in Australia. It's either in South Australia or Queensland. And we're trying to do that next year. So that's what I'm really looking forward to. I love it. <laughs> I had a sneaking suspicion that might be what you were looking forward to as well, Adam. Good luck to that. And indeed, thank you uh, to all our uh, guests for joining us. Uh, we will have further reading and resources on this topic and ways to follow our guests today and their work at the Cosmos website. In fact, you can head to cosmosmagazine.com to see all of our activities at the institution and to subscribe to Cosmos Magazine. Many thanks to our sponsor, ASE, for making today possible. Join us for our next briefing on the 11th of March on the hydrogen solution. Is it really the fuel of the 21st century? If you support science and its communication, please support our work at the Royal Institution of Australia. Stay safe, stay smart, go science.